Hey, 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 calling Chris Anderson. Okay. Yes, yes. Not uh, an overtell. Not an overtell. Not an overtell. Um, you're wearing a tie, so you're on a tour, or right. or giving a speech, or attending yeah. a funeral. I'm not sure which. No, not, hopefully not a funeral. No, I'm uh, I'm leading the uh, Poland tour, so I'm in Warsaw. Ah. Right. Ah, oh, fantastic. And calling Rick Byer in. You don't look like you're in Chicago. I am not. I'm in um, at the end of the Brittany Peninsula in the great town of Brest, where we're uh -huh. going to be f focusing on the Ghost Army Tour and Operation Brest tomorrow. So welcome, everybody, to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, offering a variety of history tours in Europe, the U.S., and the Pacific. Check it out at stephenambrosetours.com. Yes. Dot com. Uh, and look, whether you're watching live or watching on replay or listening on the HHH podcast, oh, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to welcome back the distinguished oral historian, Peter Hart, yeah, for his yeah. fourth oh, History Happy Hour appearance. He's, he's, he's his fourth. It's fourth. He hasn't gotten to five yet. We'll buy him a hat when he gets to five. But, uh, you know, that's that's when you really know. Uh, that you're doing well but let us know that you're here and let us know uh, what you're drinking and um uh, chris i want to mention um uh, uh well i will thank the patreon people first you know because i want to do yeah, things absolutely. in the right order but uh we want to thank all of our patreon supporters especially our top shelf supporters and you might see a new one there the curahee yeah. military museum is now a patreon supporter and uh, so we thank appreciate that, that. curahee um and uh, if you can, if you want to help keep the history taps flowing, uh, patreon.com slash history happy hour. And, you know, before we get to uh, Peter Hart, I just want to say that we were visiting um, uh, the Omaha Beach Cemetery yesterday, the American Cemetery in Normandy, and uh, they now have roped off all of the graves. So you cannot visit any graves unless you're a family member. You can walk around them. You can walk on the paths. We did a nice little ceremony up on the a wreath ceremony up on the stage in front. But you can't take people to a grave. You can't show them Mary Bankston's grave, or uh, you know, um, you can't walk up to uh, Theodore Roosevelt's grave or anybody's grave. And it's really I'm, not the I'm, point, is it? Yeah, I feel like you know they're they're sort of saying, well, the lawn is more important than. Yeah. The, than letting people come see the graves, so I'm I'm ready to start a movement. Are you with me? Oh, absolutely. No, and I, you know, I know a lot of guests on my trip have experienced that and that frustration, and I've always encouraged them. Please, please, if you're as upset about this as we are, you know, write to your congressman, write to your representative, and say this is not what it's supposed to be about. Yeah, and I so I encourage people to do that, and I'm going to try to do that. Although I do have to, you know, have some have to get my Ghost Army stuff uh, done and the gold medal done before I can really dive into that but i it's on my list i was really uh really outraged by that yesterday so yeah, i'd like to absolutely. make a move on that all right do you think we have uh, occupied enough time and made I do. just sit there cooling his heels long enough okay well let's uh, give me a cue and we'll get started <laughs> Ding. Oh, yeah. man. Well, I don't have the bell. We're on the road. I don't have the bell. You knew that already. Don't, it's been don't like rub how it many in. Years? You can't just have a traveling uh, bell. Oh, uh, oh. Uh, you know, you could have the bell. No, no, no. That's you not could my have job. a traveling I'm, bell. I'm the drum roll. Oh, it's not your job. Oh, good. I'm, I'm the drum roll. Okay, fine. Fine. Uh, um, you know, introduce our guest. Whatever. <laughs> quickly and mean to me you know our guest has a, has a sidekick too and they're not mean to each other like you're mean. oh they are they totally are <laughs> well anyway um as 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 rick said we're here really i'll bring him on so he can hear your introduction go ahead oh, introduce our guest okay. <laughs> we're uh really happy um as you would expect to have peter hart back on the show for his as rick pointed out fourth visit uh most of you know peter uh you know that he was an oral historian for the imperial war museum uh, he has been on to talk about uh, his, uh, his trilogy. Uh, the first two books were At Close Range, about a British artillery yeah. unit during World War II, then uh, Burning Steel, about a, a tank regiment. Um, and he's here tonight to talk about Foot Sloggers, which I think is the most important of the trilogy, uh, which is about an infantry battalion at war. In addition to those, of course, he's written enough 
World War One books that he could stack them on the floor and prop up the ceiling. So I won't list all those titles, but they're all really good. Uh, so if you want to delve into the Great War, he's also excellent for that. But we're here tonight to talk about foot sluggers. So thanks for coming on, Peter. I know uh, welcome you Peter. Get things on your schedule, so we appreciate you being here. Absolute pleasure, lads. <laughs> Thank you so um, much. So, so I, I want to get up, uh, kind of set the scene um, again. You, this uh, we'll talk more about this, but right at the beginning of the book, uh, you say, if you scan the histories of the Italian campaign, you will see scant references to the 16th DLI. But such ordinary battalions were the real bread and butter of the of the British Army. So, um, let's start there. So, who are the 16th DLI? Sixteenth well, DLI, just a, an ordinary uh, battalion of the Durham Light Infantry. Uh, um, um, they, 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 there is nothing special about them, in the sense of that uh, they're not an elite force. They're, they're just ordinary infantry. But to me, that word "ordinary" doesn't really get across what they really are, because it's the ordinary infantry, time and time again, as as. as as I've got more, got more and more into history and the Second World War, First World War as well. It, it's the infantry that that catch the eye. They're the ones that they're almost unsung sometimes, but they're the ones that have the really the hardest job of all to do. Uh, I don't think there's any denying it. Uh, that they always have had. Um, they need the artillery. They in the Second World War they need the tanks. They need the engineers. They need all the other forces. But in the end. When the guns and tanks have done their work, work, it's the infantry that have to occupy and hold the ground. And when they've, uh, you know, against all the German counterattacks, the German artillery, the German tanks, they then get all the Germans throwing things at them. And it's just a very grim, hard business. And they may be ordinary, but what they do is, to me, extraordinary. It, it, it is... It is fantastic what they did. And they are just normal lads. I mean, I and uh, I want to mention the two or three other main interviewers, uh, Harry Moses, his son, Michael Moses, and Tom Tunney. And they, you go to their houses, a lot of, and they're just ordinary people, or they were, um, ordinary people who've done extraordinary things. Uh, and that's a cliche. I'm well aware of that, but um, it, it's true. Uh, you know, and... People of my generation, I'm 68, never had any of this, none of it. Yeah. Uh, but they've had the lot. You know, the worst thing we've had is, the, you know, a few uh, COVID, I suppose. And, uh, right. you know, that, that that is not the same as being right stuck in the middle of a bloody huge war, is it? No. So, um, you know, you're writing a trilogy. Uh, you've written about the armored, you've written about the artillery, now you're writing about the infantry. Did you focus on the Durhams because, oh, well, we have a lot of interviews with these guys, or did you set out early to get those interviews in order to write the book, or did you focus on the Durhams because you're a Durham guy yourself? Uh, it's partly all those. Uh, I am from... <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, people will always say I was born in Luton because my parents unwisely came south for a month or two. <laughs> I was born in Luton, so I'm a bloody southerner myself. Um, and then I spent most of my time in Chesterfield, Liverpool and London since. But my family are all from County Durham. So that gives me a particular interest in them. But then my family, you know, we're not the sort of family that's that close. So what, what, the, why the Durhams? The, 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 they were very well. There are a lot of them. The, the first big Second World War project was the Durham Light Infantry, not the 16th the whole of the Durhams. Uh, and as we got into it, for some reason, the 16th Battalion just struck me as, as just, they're the only, uh, you lads probably know what a Dunkirk Battalion is, but after the the, uh, the, uh, the evacuation of Dunkirk, the British Army formed about 50 battalions up and down the country. <clears throat> and the only one that went into action at all as a battalion was the 16th DLI. <laughs> they just caught the eye and we managed to interview. I mean, you're aware of the chances of this. We managed to interview nearly all the uh, company commanders. We just missed the colonel, but we got three or four of the company commanders. We got lots of the captains and, and, and the lieutenants. Now, yeah. And of course, even more importantly, we got loads of NCOs, which are the, the heart of the British Army. And we've got loads of the lads, whether they be infantrymen, cooks, drivers, uh, um, um, uh, stretcher bearers, 
we tried to get it all. And the project was about 50, 60 interviews. The DLI project was much bigger than that, much bigger. Uh, that's two, 250, 300 interviews. Uh, and you, could, you know, it's all at the War Museum as a research tool to let people know what it was like being in the infantry in the Second World War. And as I say, it actually came, the book was written, the third of the trilogy, but um, the, the, um, the, it, it, the project was first. And a good job it was because, uh, you know, the other thing that's interesting is uh, working class lads from northern homes, uh, they're not all from the north, but a lot of them were, who were miners and things, miners, a lot of them died uh, rather mm. earlier than you'd want. So, you know, 70 was quite yeah. a good age for some of them. Uh, yeah. So I'm well, glad we did them first. You know, Peter, you know, I think, I know we've talked about this before, but it, it bears repeating that this project, talk a little about that because one of the things that I loved about the trilogy is you, the way this thing was carried out, you can go much deeper into these units than say, I just interviewed a couple guys and da 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 da. <laughs> but you know, you well, kind of bring a depth to this. That that was the whole idea was we tried to do this for the first world war because I'm a first world war historian. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm uh, my second world war knowledge is weak compared to guys like you two. Um, but we tried to do, um, uh, the uh, the first of all uh, and we couldn't get anywhere near it we tried to get at the durham's tried to get the northumberland fusiliers the most we got was one or two interviews with each what with each battalion right. and that gives you and often they were at different times in a four-year five-year war right. but with the second world war we consciously thought let's interview loads and loads and the idea and i've done this before on this tv you know there's one interview you can see through it okay yep. there's two interviews you can see a lot less now if i had 50 hands You'd see what I mean. You cover everything. Now, there are outliers. There are always going to be some characters who don't fit the norm. They, they mm -hmm. hate all officers or they love all officers. You, you, you've got people on either side. But you can get a general sense of what's happening. And when people talk about uh, coming under a mortar attack or talk about uh, attacking a farmhouse, you know they're talking about the same one. And you can actually get close to the action. Do we, do, is everybody always telling the truth? I don't think they're deliberately lying, but we all know memory can be fallible. But by doing lots and lots of people, you can get a sense of what happened. Uh, and and, and my, my, my aim is to let people know what it was like. Um, that's, that's what really excites me about these, the three books, but this, this one in particular, I have to say. You, you just get an idea of what it was like, what, what the problems were, how they tried to solve them fear leadership these things come out and they're talking about the same leaders they're talking about the same issues they're talking about the same problems and i find it fascinating uh i realize other people don't necessarily the book sales aren't that good but, oh, but the, those people aren't going to watch this show so <laughs> <laughs> right so so the durham's are, are are infantry and you say you want people to know what it's like and and what it's like at least uh through a lot of it is it's it's pretty horrible <laughs> they, they are going through some very intense stuff really starting from uh their very first action in north africa when basically the the company practically gets wiped out and has to be reconstituted again well, that's said you know, uh, the back end of uh, february and early march 19, 1940 two or three three sorry <laughs> what a memory um and th that battle is is visceral for the for the for them i mean they are it's there. They've been in the line for a couple of months. They've had some experience. You know, they've been under shell fire. They've been under small arms fire, but nothing like advancing and coming up against German troops who are prepared, ready, and 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 skill, equally skilled or more skilled in some cases. And and the battalion is torn apart. Uh, the casualties are appalling, and uh, they're basically left with two companies bits of two companies i think you'd have to say and for the rest of the tunisian campaign that the durhams are used as a, a stop gap you know yeah and there's a, a bit of a you know you, you want a company we'll form a company and, and add it to your battalion for the next whatever you're doing normally to, pr to provide a firm base as it's called so the durhams would go and hold the base when another unit made an attack but they don't really get reconstituted properly until after the tunisian campaign finished after that terrible opening battle of sejane it's terrible. So, so, Peter, just again, you know, for the benefit of um, all of our American viewers, um, could you just briefly describe? So, 
what's the structure of this unit? I mean, when you say a battalion, what is that? I mean, well, because uh, obviously uh, the uh, British uh, and Americans are a little bit different. Well, it's it's fundamentally it's, it's uh, but it's part of a regiment. But the regiments are sort of false herring in the British Army because the, the, the battalions are about a thousand, between 800 and 1,000 men. When things get bad, it starts going down. But 800 would be a good guess for how many. Uh, there's, there's, they're in companies, A, B, C, and D. Uh, with a headquarters company, they're about 250 in each of the main ones are smaller. Uh, they've got their own transport, but not not, not enough to, they're not motorized, but they have got transport to bring forward rations and stuff. Um, they're part of a brigade, 139 Brigade, and, and there's three battalions in the brigade. Uh, and uh, that, it's a pretty standard setup. It's not that different, I don't think, from the American uh, battalion. Um, well, I think it, a, British, it, a, British, a British brigade is basically roughly to an American regiment. Um, so Yes. Uh, when yeah, you say, yeah, yeah, okay. So, so the Durham's fight in uh, North Africa, Italy, and Greece during the war, and and we're gonna because uh, we, we we don't want to pop all around your book and in and out of every single one of these campaigns. We're gonna try to focus uh, on one small section of that, which is the crossing of the Volturno River in Italy in October 1943. But to set that up, let's talk about the fighting in Italy more broadly. You know, how is it different from North Africa, where they'd been before, or Northern Europe in terms of terrain, tactics, etc.? Well, I mean, before they'd been, in, it's not desert, but North Africa does a lot more. It, it's not, it's not crowded scenery. Uh, one, one of the things people who come over, they, they always talk about the fact that when you get to Italy, that the, there, are, there are villages with people in them, you know, or, or towns, and 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 and, and it, the, the fighting becomes. Uh, much more murderous uh, from both sides. Uh, they land at Salerno. Uh, they're, they're not in the first wave, they're, but they, they come ashore in the first two days. Uh, there's some unbelievably interesting fighting on a thing called rather, uh, sadly, Hospital Hill, which is named after a monastery, a, a sort of a monastery school at the top of it. Uh, um, terrible fighting there. I, I mean, you could have picked that as as as, as, a, as an incident, but uh, uh, and then they, they they fight their way and they're, they're, they're basically uh, the, the, the 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 German counterattacks on the Salerno beachhead are withheld, um, and uh, and from then on the Italian campaign proper begins. And <laughs> Italy's an absolute bastard. I mean, I, why we ever? I'm not with Churchill on this one. Why, why we ever went to Italy? I've no idea. Fundamentally, it's just one bloody ridge and river after another, and 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 the Germans have the time to. They set up a really strong main defensive line, the Gustav line, and that runs. Uh, it just runs right across Italy. It's quite narrow, uh, and uh, and it's based on Monte Cassino. Uh, with Monte Camino in front of it, which is much more important to the 16th day alive. But Monte Cassino is, uh, we all know about that. Now, in front of that, that's the, that's the Gustav line. Oh, there we are. It's, it's probably called something else on there. They often are. Uh, uh, yeah, there, it, it, it's called the Bernhardt line on there. Um, and it be, be, in front of that, they have another line which is the uh the the the, uh, the the volturno line or victor line it's often called uh v-i-k-t-o-r uh which goes from termoli on the east coast across to uh castle castel volturno on the uh, on the uh the, the west coast um the durham's by this time are in the american fifth army which seems strange but they're part of 46 division uh, 139 brigades in 46 division and uh this is the, the next fight. And this is what we're going to deal with today. And I hope you get when we, we I've got loads of quotes for you. And I hope we get a feel of the fighting. We get a feel of what it was like. Uh, not, I hope it, it's, I want, but I don't want people to think that, 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 that I'm not trying to shock with this. I'm not trying to, to, to be excited by it. What I'm trying to do is just show what it was like. And these the, the accounts were going to go. So the 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 the, um, the 46 division are on the left hand flat, the left flank. So between the sea on the coastal plain, uh, and they're facing the Volturno. Um, they 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 move up towards it. And uh, in the original part, uh, as they move forward, um, 
they, they, they become aware that the Germans have used scorched earth tactics. And quite a few of them talk about this. And this is Private George Bland. Uh, he's in the carrier platoon support company. He says, the Germans used to kill everything rather than leave it because the Germans had packed, them, packed it in then. He wouldn't give them an inch. He used to kill the cattle as he went back. There was always that sm uh, smell, the sickly smell of death wherever you went. And uh, they, they, they move forward and they get to the just in... The, 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 towards the river, and they're the reserve battalion, uh, that's of 139 Brigade, uh, and they're behind the 5th Sherwood Foresters and the 2nd 5th Leicesters. The, again, just ordinary infantry units, you know, <laughs> not guards, not anything dramatic, not, not, not anything. You know. um, and the Durham's job is to uh, send out patrols uh, and, uh, and, and explore the ground leading up to the Volturno. Uh, and they're also sent forward, and this is the first incident I want to briefly contact. They're sent forward to cover, um, they're building a, uh, the, the Royal Engineers, uh, let's just have a moment to think about the Royal Engineers and how important they are to any Second World War campaign. But never mind, uh, they're, they're, they're moving up to, to cover the building of a bridge across a canal just in front of the Volturno. Um, and uh, and uh, one of my favourite persons I ever interviewed was a chap called Ronald Elliot. He was a lovely, soft-spoken chap. He, was, he, he looked like a school teacher. Uh, when I interviewed him, he was about 64. I'm 68 now. <laughs> I was about 35 then or something. You know, uh, so I, I don't know what I was. I'm, I'm not good at maths. Uh, and uh, he, he goes forward with the 17th and 18th platoons to, uh, to, to, uh, to cover uh, to, they're going forward to, to cover the Royal Engineers, and uh, the, 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 Ronald Elliot's going to be on the wireless link. But let's uh, first uh, the, 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 they've they've got to get across this canal to cover the building of it from the other side. And this is a quote from another character called Kenneth Lovell. He said, "This the engineers were just on their own putting this Bailey Bridge across. We went across in our canvas and wood assault boats. They took about six men. They had wooden bottoms." canvas sides with a wooden frame at the top. You sort of lifted them up, pushed two or three struts in position to keep them rigid, got in and paddled across the canal, which was about 10 foot deep. My platoon came across and our platoon sergeant, Ray Sykes said, as soon as you get over, get into those trenches and take up firing positions. Now, so the two platoons, 17 and 18 platoon, get across and they're, they're, they're trying to cover the Royal Engineers. Uh, everything's quiet, absolutely quiet. But there starts to be a couple of signs that the Germans may be about, uh, but they don't know where. And this is Private Robert Ellison, 18 platoon. In the distance, I observed a couple of Jerry's running across the road, carrying a machine gun. I passed the word back to the corporal and he just ignored it. He didn't want to know. Uh, we didn't know what, what <laughs> we didn't know what we were talking about. We were blind, i.e., you know, there's no Jerry's there. Whether they'd had false information previously, I don't know. I said there is. He wouldn't have it. He was. He was. He was back near the canal. It was his fault. I wish we'd taken it upon ourselves to fire our Bren gun along the road, and we might have saved the day. But we were so disciplined, we didn't. At least we would have got the first shots in. And that's the first point that happens that I want to raise generally that you might feel you want to comment on, and that is in the infantry. There's a lot more arguing. A lot more arguing. There's a lot more of incidents where people blame other people for things going wrong. Uh, officers blame higher up officers. Sergeants blame other sergeants. Men blame each other. That there is a lot more because it is so up close and personal. You're right up in amongst it. It's not like the artillery or the tanks, although they all have their problems too. We've yeah. discussed it. In, but you, do, what do you do? You, do you know that? Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Well, yeah, when I, and I actually, I, I'm glad you brought up uh, Robert because that's a question I have. I mean, he 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 kind of says, you know, this is a, this whole incident doesn't need to happen, you know, the way it does. Um, and I was curious about, you know, is what's the condition of the unit that, you know, are they all saying, well, this is just a, a mess? Um, what are are they just kind of burnt out or is is, is robert kind of an outlier here no, no. Is... They're, they're in reasonably good they've been rebuilt and you know they've done well at hospital hill they've done well in italy so far and and uh but but uh they're, 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 they're still the problem is 
that when something happens like this, it's going to be a terrible shock. What, right. Whatever, whatever, you know. So, 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 you know, Ellison has thought he's seen something. His sergeant hasn't agreed, or corporal hasn't agreed with him. Um, but when the Germans open fire, it's murderous. And this is what Corporal Kenneth Lovell says, just to give a, another quote. He says, and this is a, they all start with these words, all hell broke loose. How many yeah. times have you seen that? Machine guns opened up at us from every bloody quarter, from behind us, from our sides, from the front. The Germans had set up a beautiful ambush. Martin's platoon, that's 18 platoon, got cut up. He got badly wounded. That's when he started screaming his head off like a bloody baby. We were taking up fire positions. We opened up. We could see flashes. Brothel baby, he was my Bren gunner. He was next. I wonder how he got that name. He was next to me, and he got a bullet through the wrist. After a while, he said to me, here, Corporal, give us a drink, will you? Uh, I felt for my water bottle and I found out I had a burst of machine gun bullets go through it. <laughs> I cut my hand quite badly as I felt for it, where the metal had been ripped to pieces. The Germans were just a few yards away. The buggers! We opened up and it was very, very dicey. So they've been caught. They're in a vulnerable position. There's no bridge, proper bridge. But there's a blown up bridge, but the Bailey mm. Bridge isn't ready yet. They're, 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 they've got a canal behind them. Um, and... Um, uh, and Robert Ellison says this. Um, he's the chap who thought he'd seen him before. The Jerry set up the machine gun and started firing down the road at us, didn't it? Notice it's gone from machine guns everywhere to our machine gun, yeah. which is more likely. That's yeah. an interesting thing about oral history. You have to keep your head going. There was quite a lot of Germans came down. Uh, we had to scarper back to the canal. Running back, they were lobbing these little stun grenades. I got quite a few shrapnel wounds on my wrist and arms. He means just little flenses, bits of you know. Uh, you didn't know it had happened, just a flash at the side of you. The other lads were getting bullets in them, but fortunately I didn't. Uh, the eternal British soldier, as long as you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> We lost quite a few blokes there. It was completely flat, the whole area, like a playing field. The thing was to get back to the canal and take up a position on the canal bank. There wasn't enough cover just behind the embankment. The water was pretty high up, so we were stood in the canal up to our chests in water. Jerry came down, he was firing on them in the canal as they were trying to get over the canal. Captain Whitehead, our second in command, was killed there. He was, he was trying to rescue blokes in the canal. They found his body down near the sea. It floated down the canal. Corporal Lewenden and Sergeant Sykes were at the parapet of the bridge. That's the previous bridge that they were replacing. Lobbing grenades back onto the top. They killed quite a lot of Germans and saved the day. As things quietened down, we got out of the canal onto the bank. Sergeant Farrell had been mortally wounded. I was told that he had about 22 bullets in him. And uh, now, um, some of the men panicked. One of them was Ronald Elliott. We'll come back to that. But this is Corporal Lewenden. And he's talking about... You know, in the last quote, we heard mention that Corporal Lewenden and Sergeant Sykes were at the parapet of the bridge. So now we turn to Corporal Lewenden because we had an interview with him. Uh -huh. uh, and he says, we had to get as near as you could and try and get them out of, there, uh, out of there. I was quite close to Ray Sykes. The Germans couldn't see us. The only thing we could use was grenades. We managed it. We certainly moved them. The trouble was we got to the point where we nearly ran out of grenades. Somebody had the presence of mind to go back over the other side of the canal, pick out some more grenades and brought them back to us. That was really Ray Sh Sykes' show. He thought of it, and I wouldn't take any credit for that. I just backed him up, that's all. Ray was decorated for that, and rightly so. And and there you have, you know, two blokes who've made a difference. And do you know, in the modern army, you must have heard this, and in the Second World War army, individuals making a difference yeah. uh, in any action. You, I don't know, Chris, you must have something to say that, about that's, that. That's I was going to say. That's one of the one of the things that I always point out on my trips. That you know, you talk about these battles with thousands of people and all these things going on. But there are so many moments where it's one person that does one thing that completely changes the course of events, you know, and, and I, I find that really compelling and I find it interesting because, again, you know, it's the, the idea is that you as an individual, you're still important, you still matter, you're going to, for good or for bad, right, that's going to change things, right? Um, yeah. Absolutely. And that then just what I like about oral history is that not everybody is a hero. Uh, I, funnily enough, I've said Ron, Ronald Elliott is one of my heroes. He's dead now, I think. Right. I used to meet him every year at, in Durham when I did talk fair. He used to always be in the front row going, hello, Peter. <laughs> and if you're getting old, he used to say. <laughs> anyway, this is what Ronald, Ronald Elliott isn't John Lewenden or Ray Sykes. 
right. he panics. He says this. There was a rush back to the river. I got into the river. I was pushed into the river. Some people got into a boat. I found myself in a canal and not being a good swimmer was in some danger of drowning. I got hold of the boat, which was floundering around, and someone either deliberately or unconsciously waved a paddle around and knocked me glasses off. <laughs> <laughs> Whether he's trying to knock me off the boat, I don't know. But I had no intention of being knocked off the boat. I hung on grimly. Meanwhile, pandemonium was still going on on the far bank. Some of the platoon were fighting back, and it wasn't a total retreat. But some small number had retreated, including me. <laughs> Eventually, we got to the other side of the canal. I was soaking wet without my glasses on. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where the Germans were or anything. There I was, a sorry sight, wandering about on the riverbank with the mosquitoes around, not being able to see very far without my glasses, waving my beretta in the air, prepared to defend myself, although quite how and in what way wasn't very clear. And there you have, and perhaps, I don't know whether either of you two would like to comment, that not all soldiers are brave all the time. Right, by the way, he was yeah. brave, and he, he performed fully and well through many actions as a signaller, but on this particular occasion, he panicked. I don't know what you think. Well, about I, I, I admire the fact that he, you know, he actually recounts that and is able to say that in an interview. Um, but no, right. I mean, I, you know, Rick, we've all talked to veterans, and and I think if they're being honest with themselves, you know, they'll say that some days I was on and some days I wasn't, and some days I should have and some days I didn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, and I, 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 re I respect the people who who can who can who can deal with it honestly and try it instead of trying to cover it up some way. And but it, there are moments in combat, obviously, from everybody we've talked to and everything that we've read, where where everybody is uh, is a kind of driven past their limit. And one of the things that's always so fascinating to me, and it kind of breaks away from your book for a second, is how many soldiers are so forgiving of that in their comrades, where they say, well, he, he, he had, you know, shell shock, or he had this or that, and he had to go, he went screaming back, and I don't blame him, you know, I'm not angry at him, uh, this feeling of that, that, that it could have been me, uh, that everybody has. It's a constant refrain from these from these men in the interviews, even from the very bravest through to the ones who are perhaps not so brave, that when when they see someone crack, that they're very aware how close they personally have been to it on occasion, and and there there is a general sympathy. We have an illustration of that coming in the main crossing the Volturno coming up. I, I will put I'll push. I'm sorry to to, to talk so much. That's why no, I keep no, trying to bring you that no, in. You know, absolutely. yeah, no, no, we're we're it's it's like a holiday for us, so it's it's yeah. awesome. <laughs> I do but especially, too much. but and especially it, if when, when 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 you get to talking about Brian Collins and he's kind of character, give 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 us some background on him before you get into him. But uh, yeah, go, but go it's ahead. Ro it's Russell Collins. Yeah, Russell, yeah, Russell Collins. Russell. Sorry, I'll, I'll give you background on him. I'll tell you how I met him. Yeah. Um, so the next thing is the Volturno itself. So the Durham's are, and and there's in the book and it, and in the oral history loads of talk about the the the, the patrols they sent out and that that they that they they, they they plan they identify the shallowest portion where you can just about walk across it uh, but i want to make clear what the volturno was because you see pictures i looked some pictures up on the internet before this and then i forgot to send them um <laughs> the, it, it's a fearsome professionalism by pete uh the, it's a fearsome bloody obstacle i'm not just kidding it it, it 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 what time of month was it autumn it's full of rainwater. it's 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 basically four foot to six foot deep People say it's four foot six, but I like to say it's four foot six. <laughs> to six foot. Uh, and it's some 300 feet across, which, mm. uh, well, oh, uh, it's 100 yards. So if we said 100 meters, that would be about right. It's, everyone mm. knows yards are the same as meters. Um, now, so Clark, it's Mark Clark, your old friend, you Americans. Uh, yeah. It's his plan. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, the, there's a two division at a front attack. Um, the U.S. Sorry, the U.S. Corps, the sixth U.S. Corps, are going to attack inland, and the uh, British Tenth Corps, of which the 46th Division's part, part will attack across the lower Volturno. And so the 46th Division are doing a bit by the coast, and I'll bugger the rest of them uh, because that's what you have to do. I'm afraid when you're doing one unit, there's no yeah. space for. for yeah. Anyway, uh, they have a conference, and Colonel Johnny Preston, someone we not mentioned, but. 
a man noted for his tactical ability. Uh, he get, tells them to get ready and they're going to go forward. They go to the debussing point at uh, 1700 on the night of 12th, 13th of October. Uh, a and C companies will go first uh, at this shallow point, And then the, the battalion headquarters would follow with B and D companies that, that were meant to be coming in boats. So not a lot of them did. Um, the, um, the men were in battle dress. And now I want you to, they're crossing a river. This is what they had to carry. Now, I will also point out, uh, this is a, as a First World War historian, people say, oh, why did they go forward on this song carrying all that gear? Uh, yeah, 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 what, yeah, what yeah. gear are you going to leave behind, Sunshine? You're going to leave well, your yeah, rifle exactly. behind, or perhaps you're going to leave your grenades, or perhaps you're going to leave your kit, or your rations, or your pickaxe. What are you going to leave behind? And this is yeah. what they had. This is Corporal William Burr. Uh, he's in B Company. He says, field service, fight in order. Your pouches for ammunition, your weapon, your small pack with all your gear in it, your shaving kit, your towel, soap, mess tins, your emergency rations, your entrenching tool, of course. Of course you've got it. Yeah. Water bottle, bayonet. Your heaviest thing was your ammunition. I had 10 magazines of Tommy gun ammunition. They were fairly heavy. The lads also had Bren gun magazines. It all adds to your weight. They had the rifle, somebody had the brain gun, or the piat. So all this bloody kit we got across this sodden river, you know. Um, now, in charge, is a, well, a company go first. That's commanded by a chap called Major John Moran. But the one we want to talk about is uh, Second Lieutenant Russell Collins of A Company. Now, I remember the first time I met him, and I haven't told anybody this before online. <laughs> I was sent to interview him. He lived in uh, uh, Bodmin in uh, Cornwall went on the train train was two and a half hours late I got to his house soldiers like you five minutes early for five minutes early a bit like you lads on there there he is that's he's a little tiny black well he's the officer in the middle looks about 12 uh Russell Collins I met him by this time he was a 60 year old or 65 year old he looked about 12 in that in real life and he said what time do you bloody call this (laughs) sort of thing (laughs) Anyway, Wait, he, he, he was only a little short. He really was a little short chap. Uh, he'd been doing one of the he'd, he'd been one of the platoon leaders. He, he, he'd, his first action at Hospital Hill had been a complete, uh, to use an, a technical army term, a clusterfuck. It really was <laughs> a mess. He ended up coming under fire from his own people, and most of his platoon were, were rather killed or wounded. He'd had a bad start, and he was sent away. Uh, he, got, he got a nick on his knuckle, and he was sent away, I think basically to get him out of it. And he came back. But he was doing well now, or sort of. Uh, he's going forward at the front, and he says this about the, the actual river crossing. Then, with my platoon leading, we had to make the first crossing. We hoisted our packs up as high as we could on our shoulders, put our our rifles in our outstretched arms above our heads, uh, and the first few of us waded it into the river. Ray Mitchell must have established the depth of it. That's another officer. But it was certainly up to my armpits, if not to my shoulders, being a rather shorter chap. <laughs> <laughs> Not average height like us six foot four people. Uh, anybody under five foot ten is technically a dwarf, as far as I'm concerned. Um, we, we had to take a rope across and secure the rope at the far end. That's a, yeah. Then the boats were brought up. People following on behind, behind came in the boats. The whole company got across. While we were crossing, the Germans weren't aware of our presence. At least there were no signs they were aware. Indeed. And the, the um, and can you imagine if they'd come under fire? Then, or as they come up on the bank, trying to climb up a slippery bank, soaking wet in the freezing... Oh, God. So Collins and his men move forward. Uh, And he says this. We found out, to some extent, controlled by word of mouth, and our first objective was a high dike, 200, 400 yards to the north of the river. It seemed like a mile, because when we were about halfway across, somebody behind us fell into the river and cried out. That alerted the Germans. We'll come back to that. Suddenly we found all along this dike were machine gun posts. We came under machine gun fire as we were crossing the flat ground. One of my young soldiers, Anderson, was badly hit. He felt he was dying, mortally wounded. I was kneeling beside him and he was giving me a message to give to his girlfriend. I, I never I never quite I can't remember what happened to Anderson, whether he was dying or not. We were still trying to get on, just trying to make our way making our way forward. We managed to get under the lee of the dike. Sergeant Major Wilson, he was as cool as a cucumber. Whenever he got an order, he always said, Hey, good, sir. <laughs> Major John Morant was a bit laconic himself, and he said, Sergeant Major, sir, I've been hit. Wilson said, Hey, good, sir. <laughs> <laughs> 
we were in such numbers that the enemy probably withdrew to a concentration army. In other words, the Germans, Germans are very good soldiers. They don't fight to the death on a position. They fight and then drop back and then either counterattack or, 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 or take up another line. Now, Again, the beauty of oral history, Tony, a chap called Tony Sacco, a good Italian name. He was from an Italian family and they ran an ice cream shop in Gateshead or somewhere, Durham, you know, and uh, he was Italian, but he was in the British Army. And he, 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 he said this, we were crossing, great, not making a sound. I was up to my neck holding on to this rope. That's the rope Collington them took across. The, the slopes to get up to the top, you've never seen mud like it. It was shiny black. It looked like coal tar. Those who managed to get on the top had to pull you up. We were covered in this black slime, but we didn't make a sound crossing. Further up, they were crossing in dinghies. Suddenly, this lad started screaming. He was a cockney lad, Londoner. <laughs> We got all, and I love the next roads. We got all sorts after Sedgina. <laughs> you know, the battle where they were destroyed. Yeah. Right. He was screaming, I'm drowning, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. He must have woken the whole German army up. Somebody was saying, Drown, you bugger, drown. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's all just so true to life. And what I love about it is, I follow it up in the book, but that soldier, he didn't slink away. He said, he apart, after he just said, I, I lost my nerve, but he stayed with yeah. and he fought right through the campaign and he was respected by his peer group for having come back from that rather yeah. bad incident because, you know, he had alerted most of the German army in the area. But, uh, and I think that's interesting. It's what you were saying again, Chris, about, about people, you know, getting through, th getting through things yeah. and, and you have a good day and you have a bad day. Yeah. Now, the Germans now woke up, as Colin said before, they open up fire. We've had that. And uh, they're, they're firing on prearranged targets. It's dark, remember. And, and, and the Durhams are still fairly lucky. They're not getting hit a lot. But when the Germans start to sort out what's happening, their fire gets a lot more accurate. And this is a quote from a chap called Ken Lovell. Uh, we've had him before. And he was on a, a, the reverse slope of a dike. So there's the dike running along. And he's on the reverse slope. The Germans are over there. This is quite sad. He's with his best pal, a chap called Lance Corporal Bill Crummack, who was from Leeds. And and uh, one point I have to make is the Durham's, a lot of them were from Durham. A lot of them were not from Durham. They're from the north of England, but also loads from Hertfordshire, Welsh. They're from what British Army don't put you all in one area since the Somme. The threat, what happened to the pals with that is so Corporal, Corporal Kenneth Lovell says this we came under a lot of sniper fire we lost a few men killed and wounded uh, it was very difficult to say the number of snipers because it, it could have been one or two just one or two moving about however however many were sniping they were good at their job we never had a pinpoint which we could saturate with fire now the next incident is a classic soldier incident one poor, poor fellow who went to answer the call of nature had dropped his trousers more or less finished his business and he got a bullet right through both cheeks of his heart and fell back in his own mess and i'm sorry for that just such a difficult soldier story it was evidently a most painful wound as well now he goes on ray sykes we've met ray sykes before the platoon sergeant had put two chaps in a slip trench on the forward slope of the embankment right um it must have been a very lonely position up there. My great pal, Bill Crummer, in whose section they were, went up to see if they were all right. He went up over the top of the bank, about four or five foot wide, crawled down to them. Yes, they were all right. Instead of sliding down, he stood up on top of the bank. Next thing I heard was a single shot. Bill came down, clutching at his equipment. He'd obviously been hit. He virtually fell into my arms, trying to undo his belt to take his equipment off. All he had time to say was, mother, mother, and he was dead. Bill was the chap who taught me never to stand on the skyline. I thought it was a shocking trick of fate that this had happened. Now, the last bit we're going to go into is a, a, just one instant of a, an attack that's launched. You see, by about four o'clock in the morning, the DLI have got some of their, most of their objectives, but they're being harassed by some German machine guns on the right flank that way. Or to you out there, I think it might be that way. <laughs> Oh no, <laughs> with the right flank. I got very confused there. Good job. Yeah, a fine officer material, me. Uh, yeah, this is, yeah. And this is what uh, uh, Colonel Preston, Johnny Preston, he, he's, he's established his headquarters and he says, Russell, Russell Collins, 
or Collins more likely. Collins, you're to lead a fighting patrol uh, and take out the German strong point. And this, this, is, this goes through the whole incident of how Collins planned it. He says, there's a pocket of, en this is Collins, he says, there's a pocket of enemy some few hundred yards to the east who are holding up progress. I was to go and try and sort it out. I got up onto a high vantage point where I saw John Smith, who was the mortar officer. I quickly conferred with him, told him that I was going to have to attack, and I really didn't know what to expect. This tall dike, 20 to 30 feet high, had ditches on either side. I quickly made a little plan that I would take a number of men, perhaps half my platoon, that's about 15 men probably, um, and go along the dry channel beside the dike, which afforded cover from view. I said, right, I'm going to move along the dike. You put down six rounds, rapid, just six, no more, no less, and then we'll go in, i.e. in the attack. I hadn't pinpointed the machine gun, the machine guns, but the mortar officer had seen them. I mean, it was just by guess and by the grace of God, really. I just said, right, fix bayonets. Everybody lined up behind me. Notice that behind me. And I set off. Now, this I can't tell you how. Can you imagine how dangerous this is? Chris, uh, Rick. I'm no, yeah, 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 no, I, I what I when I read that, what struck me and I, I not a commercial, but I've read a lot of your books, Peter, a lot of World War One books, uh, and and just the similarity of it, right? It's just that moment, young guy, follow me. Um, I, I, that just raises all kinds of questions. You know, the similarity between the combat, infantry combat in both wars, uh, personal leadership, just what is it in these guys or kids that's going it, to propel it, them it, into it? I mean... The, the thing is, they know, they, they, they don't know what's going to happen. We know, I know, you've read it as well. We right. know what's going to happen. But when Colin set off with it and his men, remember the last experience these men had of Collins, other than the patrol linked up to the Volturna, was when he got <laughs> half of them killed. Right. Anyway, this is what Collins says. Down came these six bombs. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then we were up and ran full tilt. About 150 yards, I'm sorry, about 100 yards on, there was a junction in the gullies, one going off at right angles in a northerly direction. Just as I arrived at that point, I saw the last German's backside disappearing into the bunker. They got bunkers dug into the walls at the end of the dike. I got them absolutely like rats in a trap. They hadn't even time to turn around and look out of their foxholes. I was right upon them and in total command of where they were. I just called on them to come out. And of course, they had no choice because I was standing there with my weapon in the entrance. I winkled them out one at a time. They came trooping out, officers, NCOs. It turned out to be the company headquarters. I quickly gave orders for these chaps to be disarmed and we just shunted them out one by one with their hands above their heads. Now, have a guess. I mean, well, you can see it because I sent you the notes. Didn't I? He captured three officers, three warrant officers, even better in some ways, and 11 other ranks. He got several machine guns and a large amount of ammunition. If you think what might have happened to that ammunition, that would have been directed at the rest of the battalion. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the thing about it is Collins was an intelligent yeah. man. A, a real, and this is what he says. He, he, he knows how bloody lucky he was and he yeah. says this i was as lucky in that as i was unlucky at salerno he means on hospital hill there's a big element of luck in these things i mean the bombs could have fallen on us I, I, or i could have got there and it might just have been a bomb proof or it might have been just 50 yards further down waiting for us as we came around the corner but it was a good plan directly and confidently well executed and it just happened to work absolutely like a dream and 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 uh, and uh, as he said, the, his previous experience had been a complete military fuck up. As it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but this just all went perfectly. And he was given the name of Winkler Collins. If you ask him, well, they're all dead. But anybody in the Durham's called him. They all called him Winkler Collins. And there's this mm -hmm. young, fresh-faced lad. You remember that picture you put up earlier yeah. the, of the lad in front of his platoon? He was known as Winkler Collins. Um, but at the time, he was almost there. He is. He was almost overcome with stress and 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 you know it 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 was a you know it was amazing, but but that and that really is the end of what I wanted to tell you about about this one. I hope it's illustrated what you can do with oral history if you get a sufficiently broad range of sources. Now some people might say, well, why haven't we got an interview with Colonel Johnny Preston? 
Well, he was dead. Now, why haven't we got an interview with the Germans? Well, most of them were dead. Uh, or I don't speak Do you see what I mean? But right. it's better to do 50 from one battalion than, than to do one or two. And and because and, uh, you can do things like this, you can get a picture of an individual action, and that isn't even a big action. That is crossing of the Volturno. Yeah, it's 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 important, but uh, it was a but successful I, operation. And uh, by the way, the Americans uh, that they, they, they got across um, f further to the east, they'd done really well, and uh, the Germans fall back to their next line. That's what happens. Uh, mm. But I hope I hope you see. And you start to, people like Russell Collins become characters. As you read the book or as you listen to the interviews, and you can listen to them on the internet, um, you, you start to know them and understand what they're thinking. You get, I just think it brings it all home to you. Because I've never thought, I'm, I'm not sure about you two lads, but looking at you, I'd guess not. Uh, we're not the sort who be, well, I've never thought that I would have been a good soldier. No. You know? <laughs> no. I'd have been very much at the Ronald Elliott end of life with right. my bad eyesight, you know, my uh, physical incompetence and uh, general uh, uselessness. Um, and well, when you when you get a person like R Russell Collins, who does, he leads from the front right until the very last action, and then he finds his nerves starting to go, and that's so interesting. And uh, he, he lets a sergeant lead the last attack, and he's nearly shot by one of his own men in a farcical incident. <laughs> it just shows you you can't stay safe in war. We we there's a there's a comment from one of our viewers that I just want to pick up here, uh, David Picker, who says, and now I've I, it, I've made this so small on the screen that I can't read it very easily, but he says, my father, who served in North Africa and France commenting on some heroic shown in some war movie said it wasn't like that we were all scared green kids and that's the thing that you know when i've been out here on the battlefields this week and talking about people and i was at angeville in normandy which is the church that uh, two uh, airborne medics uh, took care of 80 people on d-day and those medics were 19 and 20 years old and you know they'd never been in combat before and yet somehow they are they are doing it Entirely. That's it. And and that's what Collins is doing. And and they are scared. Uh, Collins, by the way, is a very special officer. I mean, uh, there's absolutely uniformly, you know, other officers in the Durham's weren't as popular necessarily as he is. Uh, um, um, <laughs> just, well, Nancy Nellard. So sorry, I mustn't look at them. <laughs> General yeah, useless. Yeah, but you, General but useless. I, I, I couldn't let you go, Peter, without showing this other photo, which also has Russell Collins in it. Which, which, <laughs> which one is he here? I think he's the one on the left. That's uh, that's uh, with another young officer. That that's uh, after the, that's the D-Day party. They had a D-Day party, and uh, he, they they dressed up as women. They did the British Army always dresses up as women. Uh, and uh, it, it's a, it shows another side of uh, Russell Collins. <laughs> I don't think his family much liked us having that picture in the book. Well, yeah, I, it's one of the things that I, I really, again, that I loved about this book. Um, when I do tours, and I'm, I'm sure you've experienced this, Rick has experienced it, you'll describe an action and understandably the guests want to know, well, why this, why that, why didn't he go over here? And they, they want to try to put some kind of a logical framework on a completely chaotic and absolutely screwed up situation. Uh, and just that little microcosm we've been talking about is a perfect illustration of it. A lot of it, it just sort of happens and, and you're trying to survive through this. But part of that is also that as historians who are out in the battlefield, we are trying to put a, a, a framework to stuff. We are trying to make it into a story and tell it and give it a beginning and a middle and an end when it really might really, the reality might really resist that. I entirely agree. Uh, you, you, you could, you, you try, you're, you're trying to bring sense to a chaotic situation where 90% of the people in it don't know the full story or indeed other than the microcosm that's going on around them. <laughs> and you, in a sense, your your job is to try and sort it out as best you can. But it's it's telling that there's a whole chapter in this book, uh, can't remember what it's called, uh, where there are instances. Um, it's called "Could You Have Coped," 
and that is just uh, and there was a similar one in uh, the book about uh, the, uh, the the five the four bars as i call them the, the tank regiment uh, there's just a chapter of instance that i couldn't pin down they didn't know where they were and what date it was uh, they told a good story that got a bit of corroboration but i couldn't pin it down so i just put it together so we could use the stories without pretending that we know where it is because that's when historians go wrong when they say oh that'd be good if that was at sedgenane or it'd be good if that was at the crossing of volturna but right. yeah, they didn't know so so don't right. pretend and that's important for a historian not not to uh, not to pretend to know more than they do uh, this is easy for me because i've got a, t a chaotic memory and personality and uh, so i get lost quite easily so i have to be very careful to try and make sure i do know what what they're talking about before i commit it to print yeah. uh, i do my best <laughs> not saying well, i don't make mistakes well um you 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 have you have made the mistake of being with us four different times uh, on history happy Love hour it. And uh, the next time you come, we'll we'll get you a history happy hour hat, which so you don't will, burn your bald head. I will insist that you wear uh, uh, when you do it. What what are you working on now that that might be? I know you you, you said you're probably two books ahead of us. Uh, so what what can you tell us? What can you without giving away the marketing on, strategy? Working on uh, Egypt and the Sudan, 1882 to 1898. Uh, I'm telling the story. It's leading up to the Battle of Omdurman. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, trying to chart a way through some horrendous battles where both sides behave absolutely appallingly. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it's just so so dramatic a story and, and the people involved. And I've also tried as much as possible to use people who are in the First World War because they, they people have this idea that, uh, that First World War generals spring into life. This is my friend Gary Bain from Pete and Gary's Military History. He's very keen on this, that, you know, you think General Haig is a 62 year old and always was 62, but he wasn't. He was a young and gorgeous cavalry officer. You know, and he, he led an Egyptian uh, squadron uh, into a cavalry charge at Omdurman. Uh, he nearly got the VC for saving an Egyptian NCO. It would have been a very soft VC, but it's certainly more brave than anything I've ever done. Uh, Beatty was in charge of the gunboats. Beatty from the, from, uh, um, from the Battle of Jutland, uh, yeah. the, the, the battle cruisers. Uh, Kitchener, of course. Uh, but, you know, the loads and loads of uh, Townsend from Cut led a Sud Sudanese battalion. He led on horseback at the charge on the, the Battle of Atbara. Fant fantastic. History is such an interesting subject. And, and uh, we're, history happy out. We're speaking to the bloody converted. To, to, uh, right. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's always nice to talk to, your, talk to people and agree with you. Well, uh, Peter, thank you so much for joining us Thanks today. So We've been chatting, of course, with Peter Hart, who is the author of Foot Sloggers, among many others. He also, you can hear him on Pete and Gary's Military History yeah, Podcast. And he's leaving at 3 a.m. for Gallipoli. He's invading Gallipoli. Can't wait. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for joining us Thanks, today. Peter. Yeah, thank you for uh, I've travels. had such a good time. I'm off to the pub now as well with my mate. Right. Ah, well, what a life, life. What a life. Travel it's safely. Bye, chums. Cheers. Have safe sir. Ah. You know, it's 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 such Again. a tough job when, when Peter's on the show, we have to talk so much. <laughs> hey, well, I mean, it's good. But the, such great stories. It's you know? great. It's really good. Um, and uh, one of these uh, days we're going to have Peter back there. We're going to do the marathon session where we get to ask him all the questions we don't get to ask in an hour. No, that's you know that's okay. Um, we should we should uh, mention our show next week. Next week we're going to be yes. an encore episode, uh, and so uh, it's going to be we're going to bring back uh, uh, Mark Zilke uh, to talk about Canada's World War II battle for the Scheldt Estuary which he dealt with in his book, A Terrible Victory, First Canadian Army and the Scheldt Estuary Campaign, September 13, November 6, 1944. Terrific interview and uh, looking forward to presenting that again. Right? Well, you know how much uh, you know, I hate Canadians as a topic, so. Yeah. I know, I know. It's you, You'll probably be watching, eating popcorn They're probably watching and enjoying it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, please subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, uh, shout at us on Twitter, listen to our podcast, back us on Patreon.com, and browse HistoryHappyHour.com. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Be safe. Oh, 
I pushed the you wrong button. button. You, you know, I, you know, I got. Come on, Rick. Come on. Rick.